Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Tackle Shop Live. Sunny day, right there you took my breath away. A young and pretty, was it just a dream? The next day, yo, 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 what's up, everybody? You came over and you fell into my Robert arms. Mack, how are you, bud? Well, I know what I feel. Tim McSee, how are Please you, Dave Richardson? What is happening? What's up there, Johnny Cop? Kevin Carpenter's in the house. Lane Grace, Frank Pennington, how are you, John? Conway, yo! What is up? Grimy Fishing, Ray Cruz, Dave Richardson, how are you, buddy? Jerry Bear, and oh man, everybody's coming in today. That's awesome. Danny Paust is here, Austin Smith. What's up, buddy? Mike Barr, how are you? Man, oh man, we got a great show for you tonight. Hope you guys are excited for it. Man, oh man, oh man. Another Thursday is here, and we are psyched up and ready for a great show for you guys. Um, we are fired up we've been working for the last week getting ready for our big cabin fever sale bash it's like our last end of the year bash and we are getting fired up for it and getting things ready um we have been putting awesome specials together like i said this is our end of the end of the season kind of first quarter bash we kind of uh put everything together and all our eggs in one basket and throw it out there for you guys so for sure, it's going to be a great sale. But as always, we like to do some great seminars and we like to give away a lot of tackle at those seminars. And um, we're not going to disappoint. We have Mike Iconelli signed up, ready to go. Was talking to him earlier to uh, yesterday, I think it was. And uh, he is fired up. He's, he's coming in on Saturday, going to do a great seminar with us. Um, we also have... Old schooler, Bernie Schultz, man, been around for 30 years in the game. He's got some great stuff to talk about. We are fired up about Bernie. And uh, he's going to do a couple of seminars for us on Friday and Saturday. Uh, so don't want to miss that with him. We also, uh, for this one, we get into some different species. And we have a great um, seminar on light tackle uh, striper fishing with Steve Griffin from Griffin's Guide Service. Now, Steve's one of the top guides down in that area in the Middle Bay, and um, he's got the ultimate equipment. He's got the ultimate boat, and uh, a really good dude, really figures out some some fishing, catches them shallow, catches them deep. He also is a great redfish guide, guide down there and catches a bunch of redfish, um, and uh, he's going to be here doing a seminar. And also, another seminar is going to be done by his buddy, George, for the guy that does the jigs. Yeah, um, we are a, happy to have um, LJ from GI Jigs coming in. Yeah. And LJ is a lifetime just Central Bay junkie when it comes to just chasing big fish. Yeah, for sure. Stripers, rockfish. <laughs> um now he's now he's on his redfish game and and he and he makes a uh, awesome line of jig heads um to meet the needs of that type of fishing for example the big redfish came up into the bay and you know you're catching 30 40 pound bull reds you're catching you know 45 plus inch cobia yeah. And these are tackle busters. These are like killers. You know, you, it's just a it's just hand to hand combat, just trucking some tackle. So he builds an uh an HD version of his jig to meet that demand, 8-0 and 10-0 hook forged. So yep. um 
We're going to have LJ here. He's going to do a seminar. He's going to work with Steve. They're going to work together. And uh, that's going to be, if you like to branch out every once in a while, that's going to be an yeah. awesome seminar. Mike and I fished with these guys a couple times the last few years, and uh, they know what they are talking about. Absolutely. So you'll be able to, you know, learn some stuff about striper fishing and maybe go down from to the mid bay and see what that's all about and, and catch some of that action down there. Cause it's crazy action. Uh, also, um, we will have a really cool seminar on BFS, uh, and that's bait finesse system fishing, uh, with our own Ryan Buttermore from mega bass. Uh, he's going to be doing it. He's been kind of messing with this for, for many years, um even even down to trout fishing with it so um you know he he knows about bfs he understands bfs and he's going to do a great seminar for bfs fishing if you guys don't know what it is you're gonna have to sit in on him and check it out because he's going to break that all down for you so real excited about that uh to have him here also i think there's going to be a cameo appearance from greg de palma so we're working out the details with him i'm hoping he's going to be here on friday and um, we'll, we'll stick him in there somewhere because Greg's seminars, you guys know how they are. They're the best. And uh, I think this is going to be a last shot for him to, to be here. So we're going to we're going to get him in here. And, man, we're so excited to have Greg De Palma here. GDP will be in the house. So that's the lineup. That's what's going on. The seminar schedule will be up and running by Monday. You'll be able to sign on to the website, see the schedule and plan your days accordingly we've got the pizza guy coming for food on both days he's going to be here um making pizzas out there so you know you guys you know be able to get some lunch and hang out for the day real excited about it got the big tent lined up and uh you know we're going to have a ball we are absolutely going to have a ball for all you guys checking in, my name is Mike Acord. This is George Acord. And behind the camera is cameraman Nick. And we are Tackle Shop Live. And we come to you live every Thursday at 7 o'clock. And this is no different, different than any other Thursday. We are fired up for a great show. We talk fishing. We talk tackle. We talk technique. We just talk. We just talk, don't we, Nick? We love talking. Well, yeah, we do. Whenever <laughs> we're talking fishing, I mean, you could talk about fishing forever. Yeah, I mean, you know, I love talking about fishing. Um, we got out fishing on Sunday, this past Sunday. Nick and Nick and I and George, uh, we don't get to fish together much, so we were able to hook up together, last-minute fishing trip, went out on the Susquehanna River, and um, it was a lot of fun. We, it, you know, it was challenging at first to figure out the bite, but we kept working with it and kept working with it and moving and and shucking and jiving, you know, and, and we put together a nice little pattern, and, and uh, we caught some nice fish. And Nick Nick was the big heavy hitter for the day with a 4'7 giant smallie. That was a nice well, fish. you did a heck of a good net job on that one. I'm you telling know. you, I'm very skilled at that. Yep, yep. I'm a good net guy. That's right. <laughs> you you want to know something, though, Mike? What's so impressive and what, what I love about what we do, Tackle Shop Live, such kind of fishing tackle, is you guys enjoy the part of the sport that I love and that is the challenge of figuring it out. Yeah. And watching you guys go to work on the body of water until you guys figure it out is awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's just the coolest thing. We've always, I mean, that's that's been our thing forever. And, and is, uh, you know, we fish patterns. You know, we, we, we put a pattern together. We don't go out and spot fish. We go out and put a pattern together and try to, yeah, we're going to start at a spot here and a spot there, but we're, fishing different types of stuff until we put that pattern together and um you know it it and that's why I enjoy and George enjoys it and we have a lot of fun with it so um and some of the some of the most memorable days of fishing that I've had have been those really really tough days that when you you just worked hard and you you know this isn't working and you changed and then you totally changed and then you ran and then you 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 did something and you caught one and then you kind of caught another one and then you started putting it together. And then by, at, you know, at the very last part of the day, when you were shutting down, you were like, man, that was a tough day, but we caught, you know, 10 fish and they were, it was awesome, you know, figuring those fish out. So, uh, that was one of some of my most memorable days in, of fishing. So yeah, you're right, Nick, that we, we do enjoy that. And the other thing that was interesting is we found out the three of us 
we do our best yeah but we're not the best although i gotta say george was within an ounce of like the first five fish we weighed yeah. with the public scale i mean he's just right on <laughs> he is he is really good with that but then <laughs> No bullshit here. But then the Bubba scale did have us go, man, we're way off sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, I I got to say that the fish we were catching, um, they they do fool you. Yeah, you know, uh, most of the time you can look at a fish by length and say, you know, oh, yeah, you know, that's a 2.6 or whatever, or that's a 2.10. And, uh, but we were putting those things on the scale, man. And it was like three, you know, three, five, three, four, but they were heavy. They were super heavy and they it was, chunkers. they were chunks and, and they were throwing us off, you know, how heavy they were. But when you, when you held them, you knew that it was solid, but that was, you know, I'm glad you brought that up, Nick, cause we got a chance to fish the bubble, use the bubble scale and we used the, um, were they, which one was that one, George? The the what's the name of that of that scale? Is that the right one? The the pro the pro series. The pro series, yeah, yeah. Bubba scale because there's two of them. There's the regular Bubba scale and the Bubba scale pro series. And we got the we got the pro series, and uh, you know took us a, took us a little bit to figure out what we were doing. But what we did was we set up a competition. We went to competition mode, and it, it, we were able to set up three three um bags one for me one for george and one for nick and then as we were fishing we were able to weigh the fish for each person and put it in their bag and keep track of their fish for the day and that was pretty cool to see you know who was catching what and and um you know uh just tracking your tracking your bag for the day because a lot of times you, you forget you don't know um but uh we, we, that's what we did. So we figured that part of the competition out. It was easy to do it. Um, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, but we also got some, some, some knowledge with that scale. Cause that scale is really special. It's going to be a great calling scale for a five fish bag. You're going to be able to call real easy with it. Uh, you know, it's very, very accurate and it locks on really, really quick. That's, that's the things we figured out about it. Very accurate and it locks on real quick. And that's, when you're out there fishing, you don't want to be sitting there with this thing bouncing around and trying to calm the fish down. This thing takes measurements so quick, and then it just it just absolutely locks on very, very quickly. So um, it was good to figure that thing out. So now I know a lot more about it, so I could talk a lot more intelligently about it when you guys come in and look at them. It was a good scale. Yeah, um, and, you know, I'm not one to sit down and read, like, instruction manuals. Um, <laughs> I just like to start pet pressing buttons yeah <laughs> you know just just go off on the skit very easy to operate um never never used one before did not read now i've been reading up on them i mean i'm not i've been studying them i've been watching videos just because i haven't had a chance to use one and i, I get asked a ton of questions about them i don't want to seem like i'm completely out of it mm. i found it very easy to use i i liked it um the the design the grip i wish we had one here to show you but the the design the grip you know very good the the access to click on to the fish very easy with a with a, a a nice lip grip that's not hurting the fish um super easy like we were doing competition mode super easy to choose the bag that you want to drop the fish in just just a great scale very very good stuff um and then, of course, with that Pro Series scale, uh, you have an app that comes with it that you put on your phone. And what you can do is, is you can have a, another form of competition where you have a tournament with your buddies um, using the app. So, you know, you don't have to be in the same boat. And it's you can set it up as a five-fish Whatever limit, you can set it up as every fish counts. And that's pretty cool. Well, uh, Scott, we're talking about the um, Bubba scale. And um, that's the, really the main reason we, that, I, that I chose the Pro Series was I know, I know this where this is going. 
we're, you know, we're going to be sitting around on a Saturday afternoon and somebody's going to call up and say, Hey, we're going to throw together a Bubba scale tournament, uh, launch wherever you want. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Launch wherever you want. We'll meet up <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll meet up afterwards at three o'clock and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, do away in $20 a man or whatever. So I, I see where this 20. is, whatever, whatever. I like to keep it friendly. Uh, you know, I, I kind of see where this is going, Nick, you know, I think these guys, I think guys are going to do a lot of that, uh, a lot of that kind of, you know, through th hat tournament type of deal where, where you can just kind of go out and, and, uh, use your bubble scale, have the app, you can see what everybody's catching and, um, and it's real time and it's real time. And yeah. you know, it's funny that you say that because as you know, what, like, let's say George was in a boat and I was in a boat when you know what somebody's catching real time, that mentally screws with you. You can't help it. Oh yeah, oh for sure. Well, that's like that major league fishing. Those yeah, guys. Well, that's that's those guys the whole concept. Freak, yeah, those guys freak out, man. They they're out there. They're just they're they're getting better with the with the nerves and stuff. But it's still still. When you see you out. your buddy that's in the Bubba tournament with you, driving around looking for you, you know. They're <laughs> yeah. Not come over to say hi. Yeah. That last twenty one fish run that you went on, um, <laughs> you might as well just put a big flag up. Yeah. So we had a really good time good on the water here. with uh, fishing with Nick and, and George. Uh, it was a really great time. The weather was phenomenal. We were shedding clothes like it was going out of style. I mean, it was it was got that warm actually, but it was funny how the bite started in the morning. You know, a tough bite. Um, we worked through that, and then um, they started to warm up a little bit. The, the couple degrees got on the water. They started to position themselves on some 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 structure. We started we started fishing that stuff. Got on a little pattern, caught a bunch of fish, moved around, caught some more fish. And then by the end of the day, we were doing something totally different. We were crankbaiting, you know, and the crankbait bite really fired up. And those fish really got aggressive. And uh, we finished the day um, strong on a, on, a, on a nice crankbait bite. So it was nice to be able to go through that progression um, and, and, uh, and figure those fish out. It was fun. It was fun. Like I said, Nick, Nick had big fish, four, seven. We had a couple, three, four fish in the, in the, uh, three three pound class we had a 315 um and, and i'm saying these weights because that's what they were. <laughs> they were that's what they were they were we had a bunch of three pounders so it was a lot of fun um so hopefully we'll be able to do that again nick absolutely for sure somewhere yeah yeah um so anyway let's get this show going and this is a section of the show that we love talking about and that is tackle talk yeah 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 matthew you could get in on those tournaments with your kayak why not not wrong with that your kayakers are pretty good all right what do you got going on here george tackle in some in the tackle talk world well i picked out a few items for you today so um you know, first of all, with all of the Demiki rigging that we've been talking about, you know, the moping, the whatever you want to call it. Everybody's got a different name for it. I call it Demiki rigging. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we're putting a premium on jig heads. You know, last week we talked about, uh, I believe it was the, might have been the week before we talked about the Z-Man. Um, you know, finesse I swim bait head mm -hmm. and all the different sizes that it was available in. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the purpose of those different sizes is to match up with, with the different baits yeah. to allow you to, um, you know, get the right sink rate and to, to match the hook size with the bait, because, you know, the more time you spend on suspended fish, the more you realize most of the time it's a matter of sink rate. It's a matter of size of bait. So the end result is, you know, the jig head is becoming the new premium piece of terminal tackle. Yeah, for sure. You know, jig heads, we've, we, we, we're, we're, we're constantly using jig heads. All fishermen do. We, we just talked about jig heads a few weeks ago and all the different jig heads, you know, and, that, and that's growing a little bit because of all this fishing for suspended fish, all this fishing for 
you know, uh, fish that we're looking at on our electronics. And, you know, to that end, uh, a jig head that we've used for years and years and years in a 3 0 hook um, is the Kai Tech Tungsten Super Round. So, what I'm going to try to do here is get the three different hook sizes. Um, I think this is going to be pretty cool. Let's just let, can you lay him down on something? Pull that off, Nick. <clears throat> so I got I got the eyes of the hook all lined up together. So you have 3 0, 2 0, 1 0. Okay. With the ability, as you can see, the different the gaps are basically the same. Not much of a difference. They're more of a of a round bend hook, so you have a good gap. But there's a couple things about this jig head that I like. And like I said, we've used this 3.0 model for years. Um, the tungsten, you know, very hard. You get a great reading off the bottom. But another thing that's great about tungsten, especially on uh, forward sonar, you get a tremendous reading on your graph. Um, it really, it that's really a, pings well. That's a big, that's a big deal right there. Yeah, and the other thing I like about it is that keeper. Um, so this is uh, collar and bar, uh, collar. In other words, the straight piece is the collar, and the keeper is also a collar style. No barb, okay? What's nice about that is, for those of you who have not used that collar style keeper, it holds really well. You get, you get a great hold on your bait. It also works extremely well with Elastec, Elastomer, you know, the stretchy. Mm -hmm. It works really well with that. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a small keeper. It doesn't tear the bait up, but it holds real well. I really like that. The quality of the hook is awesome. Always like the hooks on these. Um, but you know, we haven't really used anything other than the 3 0 for years. Now we're branching out into the 2 0. Now we're branching out into the 1 0. Full set of weights from like a 16th to quarter. a quarter. Yeah. I want to say there might even be a 3 8 in there somewhere, maybe on the 3 0, but a 16th to a quarter. So you can, you can match your bait size, you can match your fall rate. Um, you know, we've, we've, we really like them. It's called the Kitech Tungsten Super Roundhead. Um, awesome for um, getting a read on your bait, right? Yeah, just it, so what, what does that mean when when uh, when uh, it lights up, it glows a little better on your on your screen, so you can see it. Yeah, I mean you're getting a stronger return. You know, it's you're you're getting a stronger feedback, so it shows up better. Shows up, yeah. yeah it's just. Tungsten. I mean, lead. Lead's fine, but tungsten is next level. Yeah, it's it, it really is. So, um, great jig heads, and you know, one of the one of the things you can do when you're rigging your baits up on uh, all jig heads, but but uh, on this jig head as well, is you know, right before you finish that rigging process, just put a little drop of super glue on the shank of the hook, like right down by the keeper. And as you push that bait up on there, that super glue will kind of lock that bait in place. Some baits just don't hold up well. Some of the baits that we use, they just don't hold up well. Doesn't matter what kind of jig head, doesn't matter what kind of keeper, the glue will help, okay? And there's some little tricks that you can do on your own to, to help it, but for you know not getting into some crazy rigging a little drop of super glue like i say most plastics it holds extremely well some of the softer ones it doesn't matter what you put those on they're going to slip off a little touch of glue really saves you it doesn't take much little you know drop. rigging re-rigging um good jig head okay primo 
SFT approved. So I wanted to bring you that because of, you know, where we're going with all of our suspended fish fishing, um, if you will, forward facing sonar. Um, you, got next. A, you got a bunch of baits laying there, man. What's up? What's up with that? This is some yeah. some, some great looking stuff. Yeah. Well, the next thing I want to bring up it's 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 an old bait that's got a new life. So back in the back in the day, day, one of the first like major improvements in a crawl style bait was the was the net bait pack a crawl. Okay, so we got we got the flapping craws. You know, when this thing falls, you get a tremendous amount of flap. If you use it as a swim trailer, it you get a tremendous amount of flap. Yeah, they're not lying when they call that a flap. Uh, you know, flapping crawl. This is a big time, awesome bait. I love to flip this bait. Um, this baby pack across size is an awesome bait for flipping. You know, heavy milfoil you know, pads, you can size it up to the, to the full size pack of crawl. There's a comparison. You got a baby pack of crawl and a pack of crawl there. Yep. The colors are tremendous. So what happened is, you know, this bait set really, really, really set the, the, the crawl creations from manufacturers into motion. Because this thing is legit. Yeah. This is a hollow body. Okay. It's got a little bit of a thick end on it for rigging, but the whole body's hollow. So it it captures an air it, it captures an air bubble in it. And as you're bouncing it, it'll it'll release that air bubble. The thing about that like a tube. The thing about the design of that bait, George, is they designed that tube and then they tapered the very end of the tube, kind of shut to trap that air, really hold the air. It doesn't, it's not, it's not all one size all the way out the tube. It tapered at the end. So that was what they had in mind. It holds air enough in there that it also stands it up on the initial fall, uh, stands it up real nice on the bottom when it hits. And the other point I think you should really, uh, make there, George is the, the, the claws, how they do that. Um, real thin at the back and real thick at the front. And that gives you that crazy, insane action um that is so awesome in that bait that, that attracts the, the bites yeah um one of the things i like to do with it when i'm flipping it is when i when i uh peg my my weight i like to keep my my peg a little up bit up the line so the so my bait can pivot it's not pegged tight against the weight because it does have that air in there it'll it'll stand up on the bottom your weight will be down here it'll stand up on the bottom when you have that just pulled away a little bit. So just keep your keep your bobber stop. Just don't mash it down. Um great flipping bait, both sizes, the 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 baby and the and the original pack of crawl. So what happened a few couple years ago is American Bait Works bought net bait. So American Bait Works is a uh bait manufacturing company. Um, that has bought a couple companies up. They bought Netbait. They've bought Snagproof. They've bought Scumfrog. Um, they've bought uh, STH, um, Freedom Tackle, you know. And these guys do a hell of a job with, I mean, they are precision quality. The colors, I mean, this it, these colors are incredible. Yeah. I mean, their green pumpkin is perfect. Their Alabama crawl is absolutely perfect. Um, green pumpkin, red, Texas red swirl. I mean, their colors are spectacular. Here's a here's a Kusa flare. I mean, a laminate with a little tiny accented tip color just incredible colors they did not change the design of the bait at all no the bait the, the baby pack crawl you know what happens with older baits is we always move on to what's new 
But the baby pack of crawl as a swim jig trailer, as a chatterbait trailer, as a flipping bait, um, it's first rate. So the other thing that they've done with the entire net bait line is they have infused the baits in bait fuel. Yep. So now every bait that you buy is got bait fuel in the bait. Okay, so we have the baby pack of crawl, we have the pack of crawl, we have the bee bug. You know, for size comparison, we'll take the baby pack of crawl, we'll hold it up next to the bee bug. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> I think bee bug stands for beaver, looks like a reaction of Asian's beaver, but it's. But it's perfect. It's beautiful. The colors are outstanding. The size, the the texture, the density. It's 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 legit, legit stuff. Okay. Price point. Um, B bugs, $4.79 for a bag of eight. Baby pack across and pack across are the same price. Uh, baby pack across are a nine pack, pack across are an eight pack. I mean, it's a fair price bait, right? Um, the pack of chunks. So I am a huge pack of chunk fan. I want to show you something here. So we're going to have. We're going to have the tiny chunk. We're going to have the chunk. And we're going to have the pack of chunk senior. Now, I want to tell you a few things about these. So the tiny chunk on a jig such as a Bitsy Bug is a finesse bait that catches giant fish, okay? It's a powerful finesse bait when you need to go finesse, finesse, okay? Your standard pack of chunk is your go-to chunk for, you know, most of your, you know, your, your, your skirted jigs. Like, this is a finesse, finesse jig. I would put the chunk on there the, the the standard chunk this is a you know a matt heron flipping jig you could put the standard chunk or the senior on there right but here's another point i want to make to you absolutely awesome trailers on a swim jig if you are if you are in a finesse situation on a swim jig um and you put that senior chunk on us on the back of a quarter or three-eighth ounce swim jig in a finesse situation, you are going to be impressed. I, I got into a situation with that last year, and I was blown away by how that trailer changed that bite for me. I was blown away. Um, and I was also pretty pleasantly pleased with how well it held up. Um, normally, you know, it's not uncommon to lose a claw on these kind of baits, but I got I must have got lucky or something. But listen, three thirty nine a bag. I mean, the tiny chunk is a seven pack, the chunk is a six pack, and the seniors a five pack. Three seventy nine or three three thirty nine a bag. That's not bad. Hey, uh, hey put, Nick, you might want to put that little tiny chunk on a bitsy jig. Put that on your bitsy jig. J just saying, Nick. You might want to do that sometime. Put that on your put that on your like your it. finesse yeah. or your standard jig. And put that on your flipping jig or your swim jig. Good. Killer good stuff. Are those chunks, are they hollow inside? No, they're it? solid body. You can thread them on. They hold really well. I like to thread them up on. Um, I'll actually choose that. I don't really punch that chunk like I would a zoom chunk. Um, I thread it. So as my jig goes up, my chunk goes up in size. Again, all the colors you could ever want. Yeah. All the colors you could ever want, okay? So I, I'm not going to go over every net bait tonight because there's worms, there's, there's, you know, there's this and that. But I am going to talk about the ion. You know, everybody and their brother copies the Sanko, and the ion's no different, but it's a little different. You know, it's got a little bit of a different taper to it. Um, it's pretty heavy. It's not as quite as heavy as a Sanko. It's net, it's bait fuel infused, great wacky worm bait. 
It holds up really well, wacky worming. So they call their Senko the Ion, and it's a five, it's a it's an eight pack, five inch, um, four seventy nine. Got like a mor- morbid tail, like blown up tail to it a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of got a, a, a morphed out. The tail's kind of bigger in diameter than the than the front of the bait. It's got a little bit of a of a a little bit of a bend to it, just a little slight bend to it, kind of like a kind of like a jackal flick shake worm. Um, and the last thing I want to go over with them is the Packa Slim. So the Packa Slim is the evolution of the Packa Craw, solid body. Okay, thinner profile, solid body, same claw. Would do a lot. It does a lot of the. It's interchangeable a lot for the Packa Craw. It has it has its uh, very similar action on the fall and on the swim. The body's different, but uh, again, a set of colors. That, a lot of these flare colors, where the crawl tips are already colored up, they'll do like a chartreuse or a red or a blue flare tip, um, orange. So the pack of slim four seventy nine for a package of seven. So. That's your net bait um, from well, American Bait Works. Yeah, we've been fishing that stuff forever. It's it's like George said, it's been around for a long oh. time, but it's, this is a new rebirth of it. Yeah, and um, you know, uh, with the with the bait fuel in it, you know, I love bait fuel. I mean, I I just I am just uh, sold on that bait fuel, so I'm I'm excited about it, um, and uh, been fishing it, love it. Love that stuff. And uh, I am here to tell you that Mike does love the bait fuel because I seen him putting bait fuel on this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. I was putting it on all day. Um, so, yeah. The funny story about the package uh, crawl. Uh, I was fishing an elite tournament and I and I drew Kevin Van Dam of all people. We heard that from you already. No. Yeah. Yeah. Drew, drew Kevin Van Dam fishing in the back of his boat. <laughs> Fishing along, catching some fish. I was whacking him on a spinnerbait, by the way, which was pretty cool. And uh, Kevin's fishing along. He says, hey, Mike, I'm going to have to get in that box right back there where your feet are on my next cast. I just want to let you know I'm going to be coming back there. I'm like, all right, no problem. So next cast, he comes flying back. He opens up that hatch behind the seat of the passenger side and there was 50 count bags or maybe 100 count bags of pack of chunks or pack of crawls in that box. And it's the, the box is that deep um, at least. And it was packed from floor to ceiling with bags, 100 count bags of those things in there. And he just reached in and he pushed like six bags out on the, on the, on the uh, deck, knew exactly what he was looking for. Reached down in there, grabbed the color he wanted out packed the other ones right back in there again and took that bag up front and stuck it on. I forget what it, if he was flipping it or what he was doing with it. But um, then I'm like, oh, man, you you really like pack, pack, pack of crawls, man. I said, I, I, I love those things. He's like, oh, yeah, those things are those things are deadly. And uh, but he had enough. I still think he probably has like probably had like 3000 of them in his boat. Well, what's so. interesting, um, if you look at the baby pack of crawl, like, it's literally, like I say, when I'm saying it's around for a long time, it's been around for a long time. And it it really changed the, the crawl game in this industry. And I'll tell you, from my perspective, I'm a massive baby pack. I, to this day, in my crawl box is a full assortment of baby pack of crawls and some full-size pack of crawls. And it's one of my favorite flipping baits when the fish are active. Um, I love to take a black with blue flake in the spring um, on a lot of our tidal waters that we fish. And this is weird, but I like to take that black blue flake and dip the, the tip portion of the claws in orange dye. So it's, it's you know, it doesn't sound normal. Uh, I, you know, a, a good a good buddy of mine years ago turned me on to it, and when it hits the water, it it puts off a little bit of a of a contrast. It's it's almost like that orange 
is glowing a little bit. And I've done I've done all kinds of tests with it in the spring. And uh, that orange is is by far the the killer contrast. But that black blue metal flake, killer. Of course, green pumpkin. Yeah. Um well. also as a swim jig trailer. And the the yeah. it's got to be one of the most exaggerated claw actions of any cross style bait. So again, if you're looking for an uh, an, uh, an active looking bait trailer, yeah, you know, because we always talk about dialing in the the swim jig and the chatter big <laughs> chatter bait bite by the trailer. Well, if you want something that's just like looks like uh like putting work in, that thing is legit. It looks like George running down the street after he runs into a hornet's nest. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's, ah! it's it's legit. It is legit. Um, yeah, great trailer for a for a jig. Nick, did I tell you? Put that tiny tiny pack of chunk on the back of a Bitsy bug. Oh yeah, you told me. I'm telling you again, it's awesome. I gotta try it. It's an awesome setup. It's a great great setup. Swims real nice. You know, you can kind of float along in the current, and swim it nice. Killer killer rig. One of the things I was cracking up when you said about how many packer crawls Kevin Van Dam had in the back of his boat, <laughs> I couldn't help but think of, hey, Mike, get up in front of the deck when I go to take off. <laughs> now we know why. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, when he was saying about, uh, hey, you might have to climb up in the front of the boat to get this thing on plane when I tell you. Uh, I was trying to figure out why, but when he opened up that, I'm not kidding you, it was floor to ceiling uh, packer, packer crawls, and you know how deep those boxes are, you know, on those nitros. I mean, they're like, fit a small child down inside there they was packed full of those things but he knew right where that color was too he had like 37 colors in there and he went right down and pulled that right that one color right out and like it was no, nobody's business that's how you know you know your tackle you know you're organized yeah, I, they, they, I was impressed they, they do you know they they do make a, a quality product and now that it's bait bait fuel and enhanced it's it's even it's even a better product. And, and you know, we will be featuring more baits from American Bait Works on the show here on Tackle Talk segment because coming up we have a very interesting lineup of frogs. They've done a they've done a really cool expansion to the snag proof lineup. Um totally radically different. We're gonna bring that to you here shortly. And we're going to talk about, I mean, their frogs are primo. You know, yeah. they told me the story about um, when they bought Snag Proof and when they bought Scum Frog. You know, those two brands were family-owned brands, particularly Scum Frog, Southern Lure Company, family-owned from day one. The same family had it forever. And they had... They they took great pride in their in their product and they had a way of doing things. And, you know, they put out a great product. These guys bought the company and they're like, okay, we're gonna change things a little bit. We don't wanna we don't wanna lose that heritage. We don't wanna lose that following, but we're gonna modernize the process. And some of the stuff they told me, which I'll get into when we when we get on that show, is just I'm going to show you some stuff with their frogs that is going to be impressive. So we're going to do that in a couple of weeks, um, depending on how things go. Um, and, and so on and so forth, you know, the bait fuel, obviously they made a big, they made a big sound with that. They got a, I don't know if you're paying attention to their pro staff. They have a assembled an incredible pro staff. They have a, uh, a, a, a incredible pro staff pro staff that they keep growing. And, um, yeah, so some of the people they have working for them are industry veterans that, that Mike and I have known for decades that are, they got the right people driving the, driving the, driving the ship. So mm -hmm. for night, for, for tonight, we're going to talk about that, that net bait. We wanted to, we wanted to turn you on to that. Uh, guys, I was, I was wanting to talk about some rods on tackle talk before we get done. Mm. And, you know, I'm like, man, you know, what? What can we talk about? And I thought about two rods 
that in the last probably two to three weeks, I've been asked by numerous people, which is not unusual, about a jerkbait rod and about a finesse spinning rod. You know, obviously, we're fishing a lot of smaller plastics now. We're fishing a lot of lighter Demiki rigs. We're fishing a lot of finesse TRD. And, you know, a lot of anglers have evolved into having, like, a finesse rod that does does a lot of things and maybe having multiple of them. Not necessarily a drop shot rod for drop shot fishing and a medium light for Ned rig fishing and a, you know, like one rod that does multiple finesse applications. And, and, and if you spool it with braid, like a 10 or a 15 braid, now you can just change leader like that and go from a six liter to a whatever. A tw- you can finesse fish with 12 pound test. Okay. So what I want to show you is because, you know, we got a ton of different brands in here and we always try to show something different. But, you know, Shimano makes a, a, a series of rods called the Intenza, which I think gets overlooked. OK, big time. Now, this is the second generation. The first generation we we shared with you years ago, we gave it a lot of love. Mike and I got a whole, you know, whole assembly of them and we worked them out um and they they did well so the second generation has picked up on some of the features that they have learned from like the second generation of slx you know where they where they reinforce that butt section um with the infinity tape the carbon tape went to a cork They used to have a very kind of unique kind of out there real seat. Um, So now we have a cork with a, on the spinning reel, we have an up locking nut, um, split grip, nice guide train. But the mod, I'm only going to talk about this one model in spinning to, to, to meet the needs of what I was discussing there with you guys. And it's a seven foot medium light, extra fast. I'm going to try to show you this taper here, guys. And by extra fast, I'm talking about how quickly it rolls over. It's it's got a hard rollover, three guides. One, two, three guides, it rolls over hard. That's an extra fast. And on a finesse rod, you want extra fast. That way you have a nice, you know, stiff, stiffer butt section. Um, Your little transition zones right up in here, and then you get into that hard rollover tip. Dynamite drop shot rod, Ned rig rod, you name it, Demiki rig rod, finesse rod, um, just a dynamite, super light, $149.99. I've been promoting this rod for the last couple of weeks and people are digging it. So I wanted to highlight that. And then for the jerkbait rod, they do something just a hair different. They do a fast taper, which first of all, if you've ever heard Mike and I talk about jerkbait fishing or hard bait fishing in general, you want a fast taper on a graphite rod, unless you're setting up a specific crankbait rod. But a topwater rod, a jerkbait rod, you want a fast tapered rod. Okay? So we're going to try to demonstrate that taper. You're going to notice it's a little more, it's a little more of a generic bend than the extra fast. It doesn't like roll over real hard. So it, it flexes back in a little bit farther. Still got plenty of backbone, but it's six nine. Medium, fast, very light. Yeah, jerk bait, pop bar, walking a walking a, you know, walking a giant dog X, um, throwing a light little uh, spinner bait, roll casting a square bill, just that rod, right? 
149.99 again cork split grip uh exposed real seat graphite nice nice little lockdown beautiful stuff man I wanted to highlight those two rods for you Matthew that cork's a upgrade uh, from hype from a, from a foam handle to a cork handle, it's an upgrade. It's it's more sensitive. It's lighter. Well, they never had a foam handle on it. They had that. They had that uh, sort of their version of a wind grip. It yeah, was, it, it almost had a checkering pattern on it. Yeah, it's like a wind grip style. It was a rubberized. Yeah, very nice. But this cork is spectacular. Yeah. Cork's hard. It's light. It's sensitive. It's denser. It holds. It's more um, sensitive. Great jerkbait rod right here. If you guys are in the market for a jerkbait rod that doubles up as a little square bill rod for some roll casting or many other hard bait uh, applications, little finesse, the little finesse jig we were just talking about, um, and many more items. Great rod, okay? Six nine medium. That's a that's a it's a casting six nine medium. They're both one forty nine ninety nine. Intenza, check them out. Andre, what's the matter with you? Hmm? You need to check yourself. You need to check yourself, Andre. You don't like the jerkbait fish. Well, you need to check yourself, buddy. <laughs> Here's a perfect jerkbait rod for you. Grab one of them. Get a Vision 110, put it on the rod, and just throw it for the next three months, and then you tell me that you're not a jerkbait fisherman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're missing out on some good fishing right there uh-huh right on well not only that but i mean not only is the jerk bait like a pre-spawn staple i mean let's look at let's look at let's look at the tournament season so far okay let's look last week at the elite tournament on fork i mean the jerk bait was the deal um the top 10, I mean, you had, you know, you had um, Tyler McKinney, the winner, mixing a jerkbait in. You had Tyler Rivette throwing. And, and the thing of it is, a lot of the, a lot of the jerkbaits they were throwing were upsized. As a matter of fact, the one pro, and I don't remember who it was, might have been Tyler McKinney said that on day one, they didn't have a good jerkbait bite. And then, you know, talking with their with their crew, they found out that they needed to upsize. They needed to go to a 120, a 130 size jerkbait. And then they got those bites, right? What was, um, was that one that Matty Wong was throwing? That, uh, he was throwing a Kanata plus one. Yeah, Kanata. And also what played was the uh, 130 um re-range the 120 scope stick um and i'm sure just about every brand ha had a now it was interesting with uh milliken he also he all he rigged he relied to, on two jerk baits he also downsized one when he had a fish that was like real f like not interested he would pull out that downsized jerk bait, um, which was a 98. So, you know, the jerk bait played to the tune of the top 10. Um, and if you are a reservoir fisherman, if you're a forward facing guy, jerk baits are a standard issue deal. If you're a if you're a smallmouth guy, you gotta fish jerk baits. If you're a pre-spawn fisherman, you gotta fish jerk baits. I mean, you know, we have talked about jerk baits on this show. I bet you I've said the word jerk bait 1.5 million times. I, matter of fact, I could hijack this show right now and just talk jerk baits for the rest of the night. I'd have no problem with that. Jordan. I mean, I could talk. Mike could talk. You could talk. We could do. We could just. We could just shift, pivot, and go jerk bait right now. Well, I'm going to ask you a question here, with this Canada and some of the bigger jerk baits. Are you still throwing at six nine? No. Okay. No, the Kanata. That's a big boy. Is a pretty big jerk bait. It's three quarters of an ounce. So you know you're gonna want to go up to a medium heavy rod. Um, you're gonna want to go to a bigger line. 
you know, like a 12. And yeah, I mean, now don't forget, you know, you can adjust the depth of your jerk bait with line, okay? You know, typically in open water, in pre spawn, late winter, you know, late winter, let's call this late winter, early pre spawn. Some places they're spawning in the country, but a lot of the places it's late winter. And a lot of the places it's pre spawn, you know, you're open water, you're going to want to jerk bait with like a 10 pound line because you're going to want to get that extra depth out of that bait. Um, and you can just figure you can go up in line slightly and just take a little bit of depth off that bait as you go. And, you know, when you are dialed in on your jerk bait bite, you will have multiple jerk baits rigged. You know, you'll have a, you might have the same jerk bait rigged on three different pound test lines, or you might be fishing a, 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 a like a, like a vision 110 and a vision 110 plus one. So, you know, and the other thing is you got to pay attention to how that bait's reacting on that line. You know, if it's a tough bite, you want that bait to suspend flawlessly, right? So check it, throw it out there, pull it down a little bit and check, watch it on a slack line. And if it's rising up a little bit, put a suspend dot on it. You know, that really makes a difference on a tough bite or a cold front situation. You know, you also may want your bait to sink a little bit. You know, if the fish are a little bit deeper than your bait runs, let's say they're suspended, you know, two to three feet deeper than your bait runs, you know, you can add a little bit of suspend dot to that bait to make it sink a little bit, right? Some people will wrap a little lead wire around the front hook shank on the treble hook. Other people will use, you know, suspend dots, other suspend strips, part of a suspend strip. Um, and, and, you know, if you're not, if you're not like drinking the Kool-Aid and buying all this, you will. And it's it, funny how you, you say that, George, it. because once you have it like right where you want it, that jerk bait is like gold. You have it in your box, and you know, like, when it's this water temperature, that's the one I want right there. Boom. It's pretty cool. Yeah, generally, the tougher the bite, you can unlock it, especially pre-spawn late winter. I mean, you can unlock it with a jerk bait. If it's a tough bite, and you commit yourself to the jerk bait, if those fish are suspended, um, or even if they're ganged up, you know, on close to the bottom and it's not that deep. Um, there's a lot of situations where the jerk bait will absolutely shine. I've done extremely well. I'm talking extremely well on pre-spawn tidal water largemouth that were backed off due to a cold front and they were backed off. They went out deep. They went out to like almost five feet deep on the outside of the grass. And there was a bunch of them there. Now, you know, this was back in the days when, you know, we didn't have forward-facing sonar. So I'm, I'm just telling you there was a bunch of them there based upon what I caught. But that particular tournament, I was able to take a pointer 78, which got me right to where I wanted to be, smoked them. And I can promise you on that particular day, on that particular to tournament, I was the only person on the entire river throwing a jerk bait. It just wasn't done. But, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a part of my background. I'm I'm a heavy smallmouth river fisherman. You, you know, I mean, we're we're jerkbait guys. And so I was like, "Whoa, the, I need a jerkbait here." Right? I was winding everything I had to wind. I was finessing everything I had to finesse. I put that jerkbait on and it was bang bang boom, right? Right? Mm. I don't know. I wasn't there. No, but I'm just saying. You know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> i tell you what, though. That'd be fun to throw in that big Kanata. I think so. I think that's going to be fun. I've thrown that big sucker on on uh, smallmouth. Uh, never caught anything on it, but the, but, the, but the big Kanata I've thrown 
in the fall of the year. Um, you know, there was a time in the fall when we had, you know, some really big bait around and upsizing our jerk baits worked. There's also a situation we get into on tidal water in the spring when the herring are making their spawning run. And they're big. Yeah, there's some giants. And those bass are just, I mean, they're sucking them down like, like a dozen square mile wings extra crispy. I mean, they're just like all in on the herring. And, you know, you can get that reaction bite on them on a big jerk bait, like a 128. No problem. I usually do upsize everything in that situation because they're eating a, I mean, they're eating a bait fish the size of that damn laptop in some, some situations. Pretty much. Right. I wanted to ask you guys another question here. So before the elites and other tournaments started dominating with jerk baits at different times of year, did you guys ever take advantage of that? Or were you mostly like a, a spring type jerk baiter or, or how did it work? Spring and fall, man. It's when I threw through it mostly, you know, I didn't really had so many other things we were throwing in us in the summertime that never really gave it, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of time. You know, spring and fall, you know, obviously, but uh, particularly with smallmouth, um, I found myself as I as I as I felt as though I was getting a little more versatile. Um, you know, we always talk about September as being a challenging month. And it depends where you're at, to be honest with you. If you go up north. Um, it, you take a lot of that, you take a lot of that, that terrible bite away. And if you get on a, on a river, like our Susquehanna river, you know, you tend to have more consistent fishing, you know, you get on a tidal body of water. It can be very challenging. You get on most of your lakes and reservoirs. It can be very challenging. So, you know, as I got more, um, confident in expanding out to these different techniques you know which come which for me came from traveling from going to different areas and fishing with different people and seeing you know like it starts the day will start off like what in the hell is this guy doing to oh shit what the hell is this guy doing you know what i mean so i did i i did work that jerk bait in and you know i've told the story already of shallow water um and I, i'm reminded of a trip with my dad um in september and it wasn't great fishing, but we figured something deadly out. And what was interesting was we were catching them really good on a, a mega bass jerkbait. The problem was it was only about three feet deep. And we went through about $100 worth of them. So out of frustration, I picked up a reel that was laying on the boat that I was using for top water that had 14-pound mono on it. Put it on my jerkbait rod, tried the jerkbait out. It took like, man, it took it took like four foot, three to four foot of depth off that bait. And then by working my rod upwards, I took another foot or so off and dialed that bait in. And long story short, I mean, just all day. Well, what was left of the day. So, you know, file cabinet, file, lesson learned you know, believe in what you learned, right? Like so many fishermen that I come in contact with, if you say the word monofilament to them, they're like, what? I can't fish with mono. I'm losing all my advantage of floor. Oh, I got some news for you. There was a lot of years when there was no such thing as fluorocarbon. And we caught them all. There was no such thing as braid. And we caught them all on mono. And, you know, it was hard to make the transition to floor. Now, obviously, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there's not umpteen well, there's a, advantages to floor. There was a guy who just won a, won a pretty fair-sized tournament. I don't know if it was a – might have been a Toyota series or something. And, and uh, they were interviewing him. And he's like, yeah, monofilament lines. And that's all he uses ever is monofilament line. 
Whenever I hear you guys talk about mono, it makes me think of you guys fishing water chestnuts. Oh, my God. <laughs> my dad and I were up on the Hudson River pre-fishing for one of our tournaments up there. We used to go up there. My dad and I used to go up there and fish quite a few tournaments on the Hudson. We really liked it up there. So, now keep in mind, there's really no braid. The only braid of available, which we never even experimented with, is like, green spot saltwater trolling braid you know which we probably should have had so we get on the most epic frog bite in the chestnuts that we could ever hope for i mean we're just like and my dad cannot i mean it's a, it's it's almost impossible to hook these fish so that's it he says he gets this big old seven six heavy flipping stick out spools his reel up with 30 pound big game and the hook sets were just like, you know, pulling a stump out of the yard. I mean, it was just incredible hook sets. <laughs> um, and, you know, it basically became a decoy. I mean, we would we, it was like you would land one out of seven. But if the other guy had a Johnson Silver Minnow rigged and ready, and that fish blew up, and, you know, after the exaggerated hook set and the swearing and, the, you know, more swearing, the uh, the deal was you'd throw in that hole with that spoon and catch that fish real quick. Um, it got so good that, you know, you could just throw that spoon in holes and catch fish. So we came up with the bright idea on these big, vast uh water chestnuts and for those of you who don't know what they are they're a mean vine that is mean we came up with the bright idea that we were going to spend about the last two hours of the day going around to all these beds we had good fish in and use the outboard to create holes and somehow in our mind it, those they were going to last till the next morning you know through a six foot tide cycle so we'd we'd drive in we'd come in like cut the motor and drift back into this, you know, trim the motor down, start it up. Some of them things were so damn uh, tough that one time it stalled the motor. We wrapped the prop up so bad the motor shut off. And we had to pull the boat out and, you know, like do surgery, cutting the vines off the freaking prop. But that, that for anybody that wants to try that, um, that doesn't work because by the next morning, the, 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 the tide's going up and down six feet. They just all come back together again. Carl, if I had two bit jerk baits for smallies and largemouth, what would they be? Um, well, I mean, can't, ah. can't go wrong with ghost minnow and you can't go wrong with chartreuse shad. And, and I'm referring to the pointer 100 uh baits um those two colors are freaking fantastic Co cover dirty water you know to cr crystal clear water to sunny days to overcast days um but i also like you know like um something a little bit of flash on it like a like a, a mega bass uh vision 110 e ito uh tennessee shad or the ito wagasagi has a little bit of flash. Now you're up to four. Um, but that's all you need. And there's a color he won't say. Well, <laughs> what I want to do, yeah. Nick, is I want you to tell Carl what your two go to. Um, you know, and 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 I'm, he said smallmouth and largemouth, so I'm assuming maybe you give him a jerk bait for one for each. Oh, I I mean one I of mean, my where are you living? One of my favorites ever is clown. I got to have clown. If it's if it's bright, sunny, I mean, I've done really well with it um, always. And then if it's... Uh, you know, that's an old school color, bro. I love that color. Yeah. I mean, it just works. I don't know. And then I like the the matte... Um, the matte bone, chat. The, the matte chat. Yeah, matte chat. Yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, if I had to have two... You know, if you were somehow going to get go get some help, you, you would need some help, Carl. But if you went and got some help, maybe 
maybe brought some guns and stuff with you. You could get the other 98 out of my boat and leave me with two. The two that I would want to be left with is a, a Vision 110 in the HT Ito Tennessee Shad, which is my all-time Mega Bass 110 confidence color. I, I, I'll take it anywhere, small mouth and large mouth, anywhere I go. And, I mean, there's days when it doesn't play, but it gets me started. Put it this way. It gets me started to where I can get dialed in. Now, the other one that I have to have, and I'm not going to lie, Mike already mentioned it, is a pointer 100 in Ghost Minnow. Um, and the variations of that bait, right? So the pointer 95, which is silent. The slim pointer, you know, on and on. But those two baits, you know, if I'm if I'm uh, you know hooked up hooked up to the lie detector, telling the truth, those are the two. <laughs> That's pretty good, George. And you know, Mike's got to have that hot steel too. Can I can I say something though? Can I say something though? Uh, this steel. is America. Sucks. Okay. This is America. Okay. We don't have to have two. This is the land of the free and the home of the hundred jerk bait boat. Okay, so don't judge me when you see four boxes on the front deck and I'm cursing up a storm trying to find one. Okay, I'm allowed. How many jerk baits do you carry with you, Nick? Before you start shaking your head at me. Well, I was thinking about what you're saying, and and I'm like it, I'm I'm processing, and I'm like, okay, there there's jerk baits like the Strike King jerk baits. They're a little bit thicker. I like them because, you know, I tend to jerk bait a little harder and they kind of stop that a little bit where you get into like the mega bass. If you jerk bait them too hard, you can almost over overwork, overwork them. them. Yeah. So it's interesting. So I was thinking about all the jerk baits I have and you're kind of like you're looking at your box and you're trying to figure out which style you want. Mm -hmm. But then you got to get it in the color that you want. And you're mad because you probably left it in your garage and you know because from last trip. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting that you said that, George. I I well, and I mean, let's face it. So the Kai Tech, I mean, yeah, right. The Mega Bass Vision 110. Okay. And I, I and, and I'm dead being dead serious here. So I'm I'm gonna be I'm dead serious here. This is this is the life of a jerkbait fisherman. The 110, right? You're gonna have several colors okay you're gonna have mike and i were fishing about a month ago and if you didn't have a chartreuse belly they call it elegy bone if you did not have that belly on your bait you were a spectator okay um my line yeah. so i mean you're gonna have a couple of those you're gonna have your your go-to colors which is two or three colors right you're gonna have at least two of each Okay, then, in, and I'm just talking about that family, you're going to have some plus ones. If you don't have plus ones and those fish are 12 feet deep, you're in trouble. Just, just know that going in. Now, being trying to keep this as bare bones as possible, if you're a year-round fisherman and you fish in some horrible conditions, you're going to need some juniors. Now, I'm going to cut you a break here. I'm, I don't need the junior. I need the junior plus one. Because the junior runs a little shallower, so the plus one kind of gets me where I want to be. But you got to have a couple of them, right? I mean, uh, if you don't have a Kasumi Ito plus one junior, don't, don't be bringing your... Bets with me, because I'm going to go put you in a spot where that's the shit. Um, so you got to have that. So now, right, the more you get into this, then you get into your Lucky Crafts. Then you get into your um, Strike Kings, because I'm 100% with you, man. 200s, 300s, 300 deeps. You know, a couple years ago, the Frit, the, the, uh, Hanky, uh, the, the, uh, Berkeley came out. Had to try that. Well, didn't I go out and catch a bunch of fish on that? So now I got like three colors of that. You know, there's a few Rapalas in there. 
right? There's a few old rogues in there. Okay. Cause I've been doing this for 40 years. There's some old rogues in there. Oh, you got to have that. Right. Got to have them. Um, so, you know, I didn't even mention the Jackal Rerange. I got addicted to them. So, I mean, the truth of the matter is, like, it's a problem. Well, George, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about jig fishing. We were talking about crankbait fishing and how anglers make that their thing. Jerk baiting's no different. You got a jerk bait fisherman, he's probably got two or three rods that has these different variations that you're talking about, and they know exactly when they want to throw each one. 100%. 100%. You know, and 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 we talked earlier about the tricks. You know, you got to have a couple strips of uh of uh suspend dots thrown in your in your jerk bait box. You need to have you need to have a few packs of replacement hooks. Jerkbait hooks take a beating. A lot of them are lighter wire. They get bent. They get broken. They get dull. You're, you're, you got to tweak those hooks. Um, unless you're Mike, and you, you know, you'll literally fish until there's one out of nine points left. Um, I, only, I only need two hooks. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need is two hooks on the back. I, I guess the point I'm making is I'm not trying. I, I, I said this is the truth. I'm not trying to not trying to embellish here or, or anything of that nature. If you're a jerkbait fisherman, hardcore, long-term, you got a lot of jerkbaits, but you understand them. You know what happens if you go from one line size to another. You know what happens. You know how to weight that bait to get it to do what you want it to do. There's things that you don't tell your buddies about, about those baits. You know, when you're fishing with them and you're kicking their butt, you're not telling them about the hook size change or the or the 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 thickness of the hook change that you made and if you guys aren't buying this then you 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 should you should get in and you should dedicate spring uh, pre-spawn spawn of 2024 to your jerkbait game because it's it's a game hey you guys picked colors that you have to have you know that you what's a color that you would tell everybody that is an obscure color that you have to have. Hmm. Where are you going with that, Mike? Well, I mean, you know, and uh, something that, you know, kind of along the lines of Nick, he likes to clown, you know, which is not obscure, but it's a brighter color. I like, uh, I like a bright color, you know, which would be like a, or that orange uh, jerk bait we were throwing. That's kind of why I asked this. Question. Yeah. Yeah. We were throwing an orange jerk bait, you know, and had some great success with that over, over the years. Didn't work on Sunday, but they weren't eating a jerk bait. But you also told me that you're like, Nick, you probably won't get the bites, but when you do. Yeah, absolutely. Big one. Yeah. It's going to be a good, good. But the, you, you, if you notice that too, the jerk bait bite wasn't on, it was just not a jerk bait day. You know, they, at least not in the morning, maybe in the afternoon, it would have been better, but, um, you know that 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 types of colors like that a fire tiger you know that has its moments those bright nasty looking hot steel for god's sakes it, it pains you to say that color hot steel is the ugliest jerk bait in the world but and why and they eat it i don't know why they eat it it's a stupid chartreuse with a stupid orange belly and a gunmetal back i mean it doesn't make any 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 sense but it catches fish and and uh i noticed i noticed there's there's this times when those gaudy color i mean why do they hit a why do they hit a red crankbait you know fish are red you know what i mean why do they hit why do they hit one of these one of these stupid things look at this Craw crawfish are red 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 freaking orange blades orange you know they were eating this thing on sunday um so yeah, I like to have a, I like to have a, a that red that red uh, that red one on hand and a, and a fire tiger. You know, um, notice I was fishing a perch that perch, that green bright green fire tiger perch with the with the gold side and that dirty water. You know, I try those stuff because every now and then those things will kick off, and when they do, it's it's pretty special. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, a couple a couple of the obscure patterns that I carry. One of them is a is a Lucky Craft color, and it's called Ghost Chartreuse Shed. Um, 
they generally don't produce it. Um, once in a blue moon, they'll run it for like one shipment. But if it's super bluebird, sunny, fall day, no wind, crystal clear water, and I don't care where you're at. I don't care if you're on Lake Champlain. I don't care if you're on the Susquehanna River. I don't care if you're at points in between. That color will make fish that won't bite, bite. It's clear. It's it's just got that whitish kind of like transparent, like ghosty appearance to it. And when you're popping it along, it will. And if you switch up to that color under those circumstances and they bite it, it's game over. Other circumstances, it's freaking worthless. But I always keep a couple of them in there. Uh, and whenever I see that they run them, I bring a bunch of them into the shop here. They haven't they haven't run that color in a long time. The next time they run that color, I'm going to buy every one they have and, and load them back in the shop here because there's other people that know that. So, you know, sometimes when you talk about obscure colors, you think about gaudy. This is obscure in the terms of subtle, right? It's kind of like why I carry a small selection of silent jerk baits, right? Um, there's those same exact circumstances where, you know, picture this, put, put your mind into this picture. You know, it's that tough September time of year. It is absolutely high pressure, you know, like mega high pressure. There's not a cloud in the sky, right? Uh, the water is crystal clear. There is no wind. Okay, picture all that. Get yourself dialed in on all that. And you're around fish that are hard to make bite. A silent, like ghosty looking, like a, like I carry a couple of silent ghost minnows with me. And if I can get bit on that, um, it's game over. Usually that ghost chartreuse shad will get it done. But if that doesn't, then that silent does. It's game over. You cannot beat a jerkbait for, like, negative fish. It is very, very hard to beat a jerkbait for negative fish. Now, what I mean by that is I can catch them in 34-degree water all day long as long as the weather's stable. If the weather's stable... And it's a tough bite. It has to be stable. It can't be, it can't be a cold front. If it's stable, I'll catch them. I can catch them in the dog days of summer when you can't catch a fish. But you you better be ready to work because you're gonna work that jerk bait like a machine gun. Mm -hmm. You're cracking, ripping, reeling. It's exhausting. You're gonna be switching from left hand to right hand. Um I got into that situation a couple times up on Lake Champlain when I was around a bunch of quality fish and the bite got tight on me. Put that perch 110 on and just like I just from a distance, I must have looked like I was just, I mean, lost my mind as hard as I was working that bait and getting bit, getting bit, causing, making them bite a jerk bait can be used to make fish bite. Do you believe that, Nick? Absolutely, because you're you're if you're jerking it right, like you've shown plenty of times where you're not pulling it forward, you're you're dancing it side by side. There's not many baits that can entice a bass like that. You know, most baits you have to bring forward. Mm -hmm. and, and those baits there, that bass is just looking at it, looking at it, and finally they're like, I can't take this shit no more. <laughs> and they're going after it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, it's like Mike always says, I don't care if it's a, a dead sticking bite or if it's a Kevin Van Dam on steroids bite. There is slack involved in the action of that bait and the manipulation of that bait. If you don't have that down, and we've gone over this so many times in here, you know, I was fishing with some pretty good fishermen already. And I'm like, damn, bro need to get your jerk bait game dialed in you know you gotta work that jerk bait with slack 
there has to be slack involved. If you're Rob Tip, I, here's what I'm going to tell you. It's the best way I've ever figured out to tell somebody. If you point your rod tip at the river or the lake, the surface of the water, and you pop that bait, and your rod doesn't recoil back to that starting spot, you made a mistake. Now, it might only be there for a split second, but if it doesn't pop and just it's it's an automatic recoil. You look at my look at my look at my pointer finger on the camera here. Watch the arm. I put a $20 bill right here. I ain't dropping it. Right? Boom, boom. It's 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 right there. I, the rod never moves anywhere. It's all right here. Boom, boom. Now, if I'm dead sticking, I'll let that slack in there and I'll just dead stick. Right? It's just just get this down. Get this down. Pop recoil. Pop recoil. Hit it, bounce back. Hit it, bounce back. Hit it, bounce back. It makes you a jerkbait fisherman. Makes you catch more fish on a jerkbait. Right? Yeah. Slack line's a deal. Slack line jerking. It is. Big deal. Well, George, how about um how about sliding into some tournament talk? Oh, I got a little. All right. Let's hit let's hit it. I got a little. Man, what do you think of that? Trey Trey McKinney. That's awesome. 133 pounds. 19 years old. I mean, 133 pounds. That's ridiculous. I was, I, you know, if I, the funny thing is, is I was watching an interview from uh, Jordan Lee, and he was saying that, you know, forward facing, forward facing, blah blah blah, and he said that if we didn't have forward facing and we were just fishing, he said um, everybody would be saying how tough it is and how uh, it's just not great fishing. You know, and that, that the lake really isn't that good. You know, it's not really, you know, it's hard to catch fish. He, uh, he said that that's what the sentiment would have been at the end of the tournament because um, the fish just aren't doing the same thing that they usually do, you know, uh, like they usually do. You know, they're not packed up anymore. They're, 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 they're singles, a lot of singles around. The fish are, you know, roaming around. But um, the forward facing shows what's in the lake and how awesome the lake uh, and healthy it is with big giant fish but the normal natural fishermen would be would have been struggling their butts off out there trying to f catch fish because it wasn't that great of a bite for regular style fishing like you know the way we fish i guess well, i um, liked what you were telling nick and i the other day about his day four yeah and where he ended up hey yeah, caught his winning fish off a dock you know, he was out fishing all over the place, out in these, this uh, mouse of this of these spawning cuts, these spawning cuts that went back up in there. He was out in the mouth of them, you know, fishing the tournament and finding these fish and, you know, and, and catching them and cracking big bags. And But the uh, on day one, he said, I was listening to him. He said, you know, things are going to change. I feel it. In my gut, I feel it. I I just, it, you know, it's it's happening. I can, I can feel it. It's, I could feel the change happening. And then the next day he's like, you know, I wasn't as many fish and I'm feeling them moving. I feel the change. The last day he caught a seven and a half pounder off a of dock. I mean, that one is that one a tournament for him. Well, I don't know if you guys were paying attention to that that three foot of water. One of the things that I, I really picked up on, <clears throat> you know, obviously we talked about how the jerk bait played. That's what spun us off into jerk bait mania. <laughs> but you know what else? Carl, played? thanks, Carl. You know what else played? The wacky slash Nico rig. Almost every angler in the top ten, if not all of them, relied heavily on a wacky and or a Nico. Um, both on the scope and on cover, and. You know, for the most part, it was, you know, standard fare. For the most part, it was a, you know, a six inch straight tail worm, uh, Senko, or something of that nature. 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, Nico rig. And in some cases, just a straight up wacky rig when they got up shallow. Because you had fish, you know, wanting to go to the bank and spawn so bad. And, you know, obviously the wacky rig plays a major um, point in that. But the Nico rig, you know, as we have seen in the course of the last few tournaments, has become a major forward-facing bait rigging technique also. Um, not just, not just, not just up shallow or not just on a hard spot, but also on fish that you see that are near the bottom. As a matter of fact, um, it may have been at Toledo Bend where one of the anglers said, if the fish was near the bottom, but up a few feet, I'd throw the Nico rig and it would go down past them and they'd follow it every time. So, you know. You know, we've talked a lot about the Nico rig on on here, and we employ it quite a bit. I always keep a uh, my favorite, one of my favorite. I shouldn't say this, but I have a lot of favorites. But currently, one of my favorites is that uh, that straight tail worm from Missile that they made with Robo Worm Magic Worm. The six inch on a Nico rig is, you know, and I use about a. I very rarely go over like a 16th ounce nail weight in my Nico rig. I just don't. They sink pretty quick as it is. Um, And when I Nico rig, you know, it was really cool because I was watching one of the pros that did really well in this elite tournament, and he showed how he does his his Nico rig. It might have been Patrick Walters. But uh, anyways, he said I put the... The band he uses the he uses the band, not the O ring, but the band that uh, VMC makes, which is a little wider. You get a little more life out of your worms. Plus, it has a hole going in it this way for Wacky, and this way for Nico. But what was cool was he's like I put it in the middle, roughly for Wacky, but I like it in the top third of the worm for Nico. And I mean we we're big time. That's our game. Um, I think most people's, but that's 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 our comfort zone on Nico rig. Um, so it was really cool to see. I even made a note on that. I'm like, I, I highlighted my note. Mackey and Nico rigs played such a such a strong, and I'm talking ten people over a hundred pounds. George for Patrick Walters, what what worm does he like the Nico? Did he say? Uh yeah, Magnum. Uh, Zoom, Magnum, um, finesse worm. It's going pretty big. Not finesse. Huh? Not finesse. Swamp crawler, Magnum swamp crawler. The Zoom Magnum swamp crawler, which is basically a perfectly round, smooth worm. Um, a little fatter than the regular. The regular swamp crawler is real, real thin worm. The Magnum swamp crawler is kind of like almost as thick as a Magnum trick worm, but it's got that bigger body. Holds up to the weights in the head, and it's it's heavier. But, yeah, he's a Magnum swamp crawler guy. And then my next question is, because I'm like you. I'm throwing like a 16th, maybe an 8th. Yeah, I mean, no did, heavier. Did they say if they're throwing back? Because I know they were fishing pretty deep, like 30 feet deep, 25. Yeah, uh, they. I didn't. if they did, I didn't pick up okay, on it. I did you was, pick up on it, Mike? I was just uh, interested to see how that was working for them. I know an, a, a, a 16th of an ounce gets you down into like six, eight foot pretty good. Um, I don't know about all you guys out there watching, but if the wind's blowing hard enough that I can't feel the bottom with a Nico rig and six to eight foot of water with a 16th ounce, that Nico rig isn't getting picked up anymore because that wind is just saying, George, George, you're stupid, George. <laughs> saying chatterbait, dog. <laughs> Spinner bait, right? Wind on them. That's my feel. But right. anyways, guys, um, glide baits on forward-facing sonar. That was cool. Let's talk about this. So a couple weeks ago, Mike and I, uh, about a month ago, we decided to go up to our favorite river for a three-quarter day of fishing, close to the house. 
good, great fishing. I mean, we take it for van, we take it for granted. But like, if we don't have a full day, it's close. We, you know, we take for granted the fishery we have in our backyard. It's like, ah, eh, we'll just go up here. You know, it's freaking awesome. But anyways, uh, I'm throwing my glide baits, my uh, couple rods I had rigged up. I'm throwing my glide baits, and you know, I don't want to get my nice glide baits all snagged up on the bottom. So I'm like, well, let me put my four facing on and see where they're at. So the beauty of the glide bait is how you can control the depth with your forward facing. So at one point I got to my KGB Chad Shad, which I really like to throw. And I was in like six foot of water and that sucker just doesn't go down to six foot of water right away. So one of the things I learned from back in the magic swimmer days is take an eighth ounce tungsten drop shot weight and put it on the front split ring. And then uh, we were diving. We were casting her out and taking her right down to our depth. We were able to wind a little bit faster, which, you know, in cold water is not what you would think, but you got to wind those things so slow to keep them down there. Adding that weight, I was able to pick up the wind. I was able to get the the width of the retrieve I wanted out of the swim, the width of the swim. And listen, forward facing slash glide bait or getting a glide bait deeper. Tip of the day, eighth ounce. Tungsten drop shot weight, but make sure you get a pack that has the round eye on it. The same weight that you would use for free rig. Okay? Quickly put it on your front split ring. Okay? You're done. That's it. That's your modification. Yeah. It's like it takes, it takes you longer to get the weight out of the box than it does to modify. The, and then guess what? If you don't want it, if you want to fish that same $60 bait later, guess what? Take it off if you want it shallower. Um, yeah, that, uh, Matty Wong was throwing a swim, uh, the swim glide bait, bait on glide bait. on the forward facing. Well, a lot awesome. of guys, a lot well, of guys, a lot of guys. Threw that's it. a Millican trick yeah. too, man. Yeah. A lot of guys were throwing that's how you that, won that open, were throwing those, uh, glide baits when they were catching some freaking giant fish on them things, man. Unreal. Okay. Of course we talked about the jerk bait. Yeah. Of course. I mean, do we really need to talk about the Demiki rig? Yeah, I rigging. say that we no longer go into depth on the Demiki rig. Yeah. There is no more words left in the English language that we can use to describe the Demiki rig <laughs> or the moping rig yeah. or hover strolling or mid depth strolling. Um, what else we got? I don't even know. I don't even know all the names. Some guy asked me uh, about this technique that they were using in the in the tournaments with this forward facing and he says like with a little jig head and everything i said well you know i started busting off all of them except for Domink. i didn't say dominky rigging I, you know strolling you know hover rigging all this other stuff <laughs> then the last thing i said was dominky oh that's it that's the one i said well so all them other ones i said yeah it's the same thing <laughs> well it's kind of like from where you're from right so dominky rigging got its name like got famous in tennessee right so down there they call it dominky rigging it's like soda Coke, pop, depends where you're from, right? We're all saying the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I don't know. So anyways, uh, the elite on Lake Fork, I'm, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys are all up on us. But check this out, guys. On the last day, there was a 10-plus caught by Tyler Rivette, 10-12, and he said, you know, somebody's going to catch an 11. And before he had time to realize that somebody said that, there was an 11-plus caught. And I don't remember who caught that. I, I I did not make my note on that. Who'd you say, Tyler Rivette? Hamner. Top, Hamner, Ham, that's Hamner. right. Yeah, that's right. So that was just the last day. And every top 10 angler the last day cracked 100 pounds. I mean, come on. Did you see uh, Cooper Gallant? was like two minutes away from not cracking 100 pounds. Right. So that was interesting. Just like he was two minutes away from not making the final round. Right. Yep. I think he caught that fish to make him the final round. I think he caught it on the last minute. Mm -hmm. 
and knocked out uh, Matty Wong. Oh, <laughs> what a freaking oh, really? disaster, man. Yeah, and then he did the same thing on the last day. He said he was so worried he wasn't going to crack the top, the, the 100 pounds, which should have been easy, he said. Well, the last three minutes, he finally caught one that put him over. Him I mean over. to tell you, man, watching that, you know, we were fishing, of course, so we had it on in the boat. But I uh, uh, wonder how much it's going to cost them to make all them belts. Uh, they're going probably Timu on that. Uh, they're probably going to go Timu on that. Does it, did uh, did Matty Wong have 100 pounds? <laughs> no, I guess not. I guess, I guess he didn't. Yeah, they, no. I don't know. Because he didn't he did. make the cut. No, nobody that didn't make the cut. Made, oh, okay. Made just just the top ten. Yeah. So they had ten. They're going to give out ten belts. Yeah. Oh my God. Those things aren't cheap. I was looking into one of them. I always wanted to have one. Mike's going to get his own. I was going to make one that said great, you know, of greatest fisherman ever. They're getting theirs off of T Mill. They're expensive. Not on T Mill. Well, whatever. But guys, let's get you know, let's talk about this for a second. Is 30 pounds the new norm? Well, well you better pump the brakes there, fella. <laughs> You're going to see a lot more. So, I personally have never caught 30-pound limit. And I don't think anybody I've ever fished with has caught a 30-pound limit. I did see a 30-pound limit weighed in in a tournament one time. Uh, but now... It's raining 30 pound limits. Now, I think that's a testimony to Lake Fork, obviously. But you know what we had today? Didn't they, uh, have, th didn't they have a 30 pound bag in uh, today? Uh, yeah, today. But didn't they have one at uh, Toledo Bend? Too? They had more than one. Yeah, they had several at, at, at Toledo Bend. I, I, yeah, I think you're right. Let's Nick. see. Let's check a lot the Toledo more Bend notes. A lot more of them. Toledo Bend. Whoops. Life and Times of the Bend. Uh, 14 bags over 30. 14 bags over 30. In Toledo Bend with a 10-9 kicker. So, I mean, that's just what's going on. That, I mean, if you that don't catch facing? a 30-pound bag, you're just like, you're a punk. <laughs> but check this out. Today, Santee Cooper, guy in first place, 30 pounds, 6 ounce. Guy in third place, guy you might know, his name's Dakota Ebear. He got off the old Floyd Duckett's uh, tournament circuit, got to the Opens. He's going to make his way to the Elites, and he's getting there. 27-6 in third place. Scott Martin in 10th place, 25-4. Gosh, man, they're catching him. How'd our boy do? Bro, 48th place is 20-pound one ounce. How'd Tucker Smith do? I don't know. I, I didn't have time to go over everybody. Mm. You know, George, I brought this up in pre-tackle shop live about how these tournaments are going. And, you know, you guys fished a lot of tournaments, a lot of multiple day tournaments, and you always had in your head what you needed to make the top cut or to win. Even it's all going away because you had these guys that are like, Oh, I got 20 pounds. I should be good. I'll get me into you go to weigh in. It's like, Whoa, wait a minute. I'm in trouble here. Yeah, these weights, oh. are, these weights are incredible. Oh, absolutely. And that goes both ways. Um, but, yeah, I can't even tell you how many times I had, like, a mega bag. And before I even get docked up on the shoreline with my boat to go to the way, and I hear the announcer naming off, like, bag after bag. Like, was I even fishing on the right lake today? What did I... I did something terribly wrong today, okay? I don't know what it is, but I made a horrible mistake. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, seven-pound, eight-ounce baby Jesus, for doing whatever it was I did, but I need some help here. Yeah. And I got, like, 18 pounds, right? And I'm feeling good about life. And that's happened more than once. Um, But you learn from that kind of stuff, you know, just like these guys do. I mean, we got elite anglers the Bassmaster elite anglers and i'm just going to put this out there for you just just an fyi they're the best bass tournament pros that there are and i'm not taking anything away from the bass pro tour guys there are some sticks on that tour and they're probably the best that there are i mean we 
It were it reminds me of the scene in Anchorman when all the news teams come together to fight to the death, and Brick's like, "I got a hand grenade," but I mean, I'm gonna put the elite guys <laughs> as the best, even though the Bass Pro Tour guys are like, "That guy's a freaking dick." I'm never coming to a store again, um, and I don't mean it demeaningly. I'm just making a statement because you know, in America, we can make statements. And listen, there was guys in both of these tournaments that looked like they weren't even on the same lake, and they're the best. They're the best, okay? You don't always get dialed in. You know, as a matter of fact, if you looked at uh, Toledo Bend, a lot of them weren't dialed in. And that translates to that was a tough tournament. The guys on the top always make it look easy, but if you watch this elite tournament at Fork and you listen to these guys talk, they were only getting five to seven, eight bites a day. They were capitalizing on them, and they were all big. Yeah. I mean, five-pounders were small, okay? Yeah. So, like, you know, when you when you're looking at the standings and you're like, you know, oh, you know, uh, Rick Clon only had uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Look at the tournament standings and say, that must have been a tough tournament because these guys don't have anything to prove to anybody, right? And if 80% of them are, looked like they were on a different lake, they were. It was tough, Yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, case in point. When you when you say what you said, George, about you're getting five bites a day, six bites a day, they're all going to be over six or seven, eight, nine pounds, whatever. And now you got to land them all. Yeah. Oh, what's the odds of that? I mean, for God's sakes, we didn't even bring that part of it up. Well, they did lose a lot of fish, but yeah. I mean, you have very limited. You see room the size of that, that one that Matty Wong lost. That was his top ten. Lost him a top ten. I guarantee you that thing. He said he even said that's going to haunt me. That was a friggin' giant. Hey, just hold on one second. Uh, Tucker Smith is in 104th with 14.5. Uh, 14.5. They're uh, at just exactly what I just got done saying. There's a nice solid bag of fish, right? And you're in 104th place. But springtime um, tournaments go like this. Tomorrow, them top guys. That guy with 30 pounds, six, he might catch 14 pounds. And Tucker Smith might catch 29.9. And guess who goes where? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the spring for you. Okay. And and I I would like to I would like to suggest that when you're watching these events, including the classic that's coming up in two weeks, very tricky stuff. Very tricky stuff. Hero on day one, zero on day two, or vice versa, because the weather patterns and the nighttime temperatures cause bass to do insane things. Yeah. You know, bass will move. Like, if you think a mile is far for a bass to move in a couple hours, it's not, okay? Um. So, anyways, I, I mean, I found those two tournaments. Now we got Santee Cooper, uh, Bass Open. Okay, we got a hundred and something anglers trying to vie for nine spots to make the elites. Um, we got we're pulling obviously for a number of them, Ish being one of them. Um, didn't check on Ish today. Didn't get a chance to see where he finished, but um, tomorrow's day two. Tomorrow is the most critical day of the tournament. So what we need to see tomorrow is what this weather pattern's doing, right? Because the weather is going south a little bit. Ish struggled. Ah. 115th with 13.9. Okay, so what I just said, like tomorrow is a whole different game, and that 13.9 keeps you in it. So, again, the leaders can struggle tomorrow, and the, the backpackers can jump up. Yep. So I can tell you, you know, the guys like Ish and Tucker Smith, they're not they're not at home licking their wounds. They're at home preparing for battle. So tomorrow's gonna be a great day to watch. I'm not gonna work at all tomorrow. I'm just gonna sit at my computer and watch 
bass fishing tournament all day. <laughs> Anybody wants to come in and see me, come on in. I'll have it on the TV, and uh, we'll just ch we'll just chill all day. Don't forget, guys. Um, next weekend, uh, while well, I still have a bunch of guys on here, don't forget it's uh, um, cabin fever sale next weekend, starting on Friday and Saturday. Um, so you make sure you get in for that for sure. Did I tell you about my hand grenade, my bomb, my, my end of the nighter? So the 2024 Bass Fishing Hall of Fame class was announced recently. And I'd like to run down a few of the guys that are on there. Fred Arbogast. Did you ever hear of the jitterbug? You may have heard of it. Fred Arbogast invented it. Uh, but. I'm thinking, what can I say about Fred Arbogast that's, like, really cool? So think about the Jackal Pompadour. Think about the Mega Bass I-Wing, right? Crazy Crawler. Oh, Fred did that. Oh, Fred did that back in the day-day with the Crazy Crawler. Okay? Him and uh, his name was James Hedden. Now, the crazy crawler went under the head and name, but those two guys together made it. It was a collab. They were doing collabs before collabs were cool. And that bait was like a predecessor to some of the top top water baits, the Pompadour, the I Wing, some of the top top water baits today for hunting big fish, right? So he's going in. Uh, Skeet Reese, right? My prediction for Skeet Reese is he will have on a complete yellow three-piece suit. Tuxedo, yellow. Top to bottom. Yellow tuxedo. Okay? I may try to skew the bet when I see him at ICAST this year. But the guy I'm really interested in is Alfred Williams. Alfred mm. Williams was the first African-American to compete in bass tournaments. And he 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 qualified for the Federation Nationals in 83 and won them on his home lake of Ross Barnett in Mississippi. And he won over 200 tournaments on that lake. Wow. And then he got so caught up in the bass game that he 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 changed the status of his well-paying government job as a postmaster to part-time, postal worker, so he could fish tournaments. He made the 83 Classic by winning that federation. You know, the federation, if you win in your division, you go to the Classic. Um, again, pioneered African-Americans in bass tournaments and extremely well-known as a frog fisherman, snag, yep. snag-proof frog guy. Yep. Alfred Williams, um, I watched him on TV not too long ago doing a show. And uh, tremendous, tremendous. And then number four, we don't even have to really talk about him. Number four is Mark Zona. Mark Zona is getting in the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know if the public can buy tickets for this bad boy, but that one there, you're going to want to go to because there's going to be a Hall of Fame party afterwards. That would be well worth crashing. That would. Because Mark Zona is one of the coolest cats in bass fishing <clears throat> by any measurement that you have. You know, Mark Zona started out fishing tournaments like all the rest of us. Um, he got up into the bass opens, which were called something else at the time. And, you know, he... he Excelled there. Of course, his television show. I mean, I, you know, you don't have to talk about the man. The man is unbelievable. Yep. Mark awesome. Zona is great to work with. We've awesome. had him here at the shop. Um, we see him every year. He's a great guy. So that's your Bass Fishing Hall of Fame class 2024. Um, Did you guys get to see when they told Zona? No. So it was on live. And I think I was driving at the time, and I'm watching it. And it was, it was interesting because... Well, well deserved, you know. Yeah. Um, and he did not know that they were going to announce that he didn't even know. 
And when they announced it, it was funny because he always has something to say. <laughs> like he always, yeah. you know, is Zona. And he couldn't. He didn't know what to say. He was kind of like, he's like, guys, I'm just mumbling stuff. I don't even know what to say. It was really cool. Yeah. It was really, really cool yeah. to see him get that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's Pretty great. Neat. That's great. Well, um, uh, just want to give let let everybody know um, our, that our thoughts and prayers are going out to Gogo Gomez. He lost his brother uh, the other day. Uh, I hate ending the shows like this, but I just wanted to let everybody know about Gogo's brother, and because um, Gogo is a big part of part of everybody, and and we he's he's, he's part of our show here. And everybody knows him. Uh, lost his brother here uh, over the weekend. So Gogo, our thoughts and prayers are with you and. Absolutely. Go goes go goes part of the SFT family. Yeah, absolutely. So our thoughts and prayers are for you, Go Go. And then also uh probably all you guys are are uh have found out that uh uh the guy who worked for us for many, many, many years, Michael Poole, passed away, lost his battle against cancer on Friday last week. Courageous, hard fought battle. Uh great guy. Um, but so just so you guys know, um you know, Mike, Mike passed away on Friday and he is living in a better place right now. And, um, our thoughts and prayers go out to his family. So losing uh, too many people here these last couple of weeks, but, um, so thank you guys so much for listening tonight. And, uh, don't forget cabin fever next weekend, Ike and Nelly, uh, Bernie Schultz, GDP, all kinds of great stuff, specials, free free uh, giveaways. I can't wait. Crazy, crazy stuff going I, on. I, I'll tell you, I put together a sales sheet. It's worth coming in. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you right now. Um, I, I'm just going to tell you, you don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss this sucker right here. Yeah. Trust me when I tell you, you do not want to miss. I would be here early. And I would be knocking on the door saying, let's go. So until next time, we'll see you on the next Tackle Shop Live. You took my breath away. A young and pretty, you was it just a dream? The next day you called me up, you told me I'm your little buttercup. You came over and you fell into my arms. Well, I know what I feel. Please tell me your love is real. You make me